Today we'll be doing a brief video concentrating on the textual basis of the English Heritage Version. Here's my outline. In the Old Testament, we'll talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Septuagint and the EHV's use of those. Then we'll move into New Testament, and I have that arranged with famous passages coming first. That's the longer ending of Mark, the story of the woman taken in adultery, and what's known as the Kama Johannium. Uh, then we'll look at the EHV and the Textus Receptus, the EHV and the Tyndall House Greek New Testament, and other passages that I found interesting. Uh, the EHV says it's a gender accurate translation. We'll compare that with the modern gender neutral translations, the 2011 NIV and the older New Revised Standard Version. The EHV says that it tries not to drain the translation of interest by removing figures of speech. So we'll look at a few of those, and then I have some other miscellaneous observations. Almost immediately upon beginning to read the EHV in the book of Genesis, you'll find additional material that's not in the King James Version. Here in verse 9, you'll see um, a sentence in brackets, and as the footnote says, this information is provided from the Greek Old Testament, that is the Septuagint. It is not in the Hebrew text. Another example appears just a few pages later in Genesis 4.8, where the EHV has Cain saying to his brother Abel, let's go into the field. The footnote there explains that those words are missing from the Hebrew text, but they are supplied from the ancient versions, such as the Septuagint. For a third example, I'm taking you to Genesis 7, verses 2 and 3. You'll see an additional word here that's not in the King James, for instance, the word clean. And then this uh, information in half brackets, which the footnote indicates are in the Greek Old Testament but are not in the Hebrew and they explain that, that there's a possibility that the Hebrew copyist skipped that information because of the repetition of the word female. The uh, EHV sometimes adopts Dead Sea Scroll readings. So I have you here looking at Isaiah 14.4 where the EHV has that read how his fury has ended, but there's a note, and the note says that the, trans the translation follows the Dead Sea Scroll of Isaiah, the Greek, and the Syriac, and the meaning of the Hebrew is uncertain. In most translations I've seen, they, they use something like Golden City as the translation. On this chart, I give you some other examples of where the HV follows the Dead Sea Scrolls against the Masoretic text. And then at the bottom of the chart, a few examples of where it follows the Masoretic text rather than the Dead Sea Scrolls. I will not read this chart to you. I encourage you to pause and look at it in detail if you wish. I started this video by giving a few examples of where the EHB follows the Septuagint. Here's another example for, from 1 Samuel 14:41 where this material here in half brackets is inserted and the footnote explains that it's from the Greek Old Testament. Um, on this chart I show you two more examples of where that's true and then um, the middle bullet explains that, at least in my opinion, it, uh, the EHV tends to follow the Masoretic text against the Septuagint and one example is in 1 Samuel 9.25 then, very interestingly, in 1 Samuel 20, 41, it appears to me to merge the Masoretic and the Septuagint together in providing a translation that reads from the south side of the mound, taking from the mound from the Septuagint and from the south side from the Masoretic text. Now we'll move to the New Testament to a section that I've called Famous Passages. And those passages are the longer ending of Mark, the Pericope Adulterae, and the Comma Johannium. You're looking now at the footnote to Mark 16, the end of the passage, verses 9 through 20. They say they include, because they're in the vast majority of Greek manuscripts, 
there is evidence for the existence back to the second century and that the verses were read in worship services on Easter and Ascension Day. They acknowledge their absence in a few early manuscripts and translations and that there is sometimes at least a few manuscripts have a different ending. But they've decided to include the longer ending of Mark. They've decided to include the uh, Pericope Adulterae and you can read the footnote here on that chart and they omit the Comma Johannium uh, because of the lack of evidence for it as the footnote says. Now we'll move to a section of the video where we look at the HV's rejection of Textus Receptus readings. The readings I've chosen to look at are those that are in the Textus Receptus but are absent from the majority tradition like this one here in Luke 2.22 where the Textus Receptus has her purification but just about all manuscripts have there. Other examples are Acts 8.37 where the EHV omits uh, the, the portion of the verse where Philip says if you believe with all your heart you may be baptized. The Acts 9, 5 through 6 passage, the uh, Acts 24, 6 through 8 passage, Colossians 1, 14, where the King James Version has through his blood, reminiscent of the passage in Ephesians, the HV omits that. Revelation 8, 13, the HV has an eagle, where KJV has angel. 16, 5, Rather than, and shalt be, following some editions of the Textus Receptus, the HV has the Holy One. And in 2219, the HV has tree rather than book. I've entitled the next section of the video the EHV in the Tyndall House Greek New Testament, which we will indicate as THGNT in the rest of the video. When I was preparing my um, video review of the Tyndall House Greek New Testament, I found nine instances where Tyndall House disagrees with the United Bible Society's 5th edition, where the UBS 5 indicates with an A in curly brackets that it is certain of its reading. So where UBS 5 says it's certain the reading is correct, Tyndall House disagrees with it. So what I've done here is I've looked at those nine passages to see whether EH, the EHV agrees with Tyndall House or UBS 5. It turns out that in seven of the nine locations it agrees with Tyndall House. The first one here is in Matthew 18.26 where Tyndall House and the EHV include Master in the text, but the UBS 5 omits it. Uh, other Instances will just move through rapidly. Mark 9.29, the HV and Tyndall House include and fasting. UBS 5 omits them, those words. Luke 22.43 through 44, there's a section here about sweat falling like great drops of blood to the ground, which UBS 5 omits, but EHV and Tyndall House include. Uh, the words, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing, from Luke 23, 34, are omitted in UBS 5, but included in the EHV and Tyndall House. In John 7, 39, EHV and Tyndall House include holy before spirit. That word holy is absent in UBS 5. Incidentally, in these charts on the right, where it reads UBS 5, I've just taken the EHV and modified it so that it agrees with UBS 5. Hebrews 13.25, Tyndall House and EHV include an Amen at the end. Revelation 5.9, Tyndall House and EHV have you bought us, whereas in UBS 5 that us is missing. There are two examples of the nine. So 7 of 9 EHV agrees with Tyndall House. In two instances it disagrees. It disagrees with Tyndall House in Romans 5.1 where Tyndall House has chosen the subjunctive let us have peace and uh, the EHV has the indicative we have peace. And then again in 1 Corinthians 1, 6, and 7 where the Tyndall House has rearranged material and the EHV follows the UBS 5 order. 
In this next section, we'll look at a few select passages. Uh, they're select in the sense that I have selected them because they're of interest to me. Uh, the first one is John 1.18, which you see here. Only the only begotten Son, who is close to the Father's side, has made him known. Compare that with the reading in the 1995 New American Standard Bible, which has the only begotten God. The, the uh, NASB is following the uh, United Bible Society's 5th edition, the Nestle Elan 28th edition, which have the same Greek text. The HV translators um, chose Son, which is the majority reading, and uh, it turns out that the Tyndall House Greek New Testament also reads Son at this point. Our next uh, select passage is from 1 Timothy 3.16 where the HV has undeniably great is the mystery of godliness. He was revealed in flesh. This is a passage where in the King James Version it says God was manifest in the flesh. Here the EHV agrees with both the United Bible Society's 5th edition and the Tyndall House Greek New Testament against the majority text. In Luke 4.44, the EHV has, and he continued to preach in the synagogues in the land of the Jews. The footnote there says that land of the Jews is literally Judea. The King James Version has, uh, he preached in the synagogues of Galilee. Here the EHV is in agreement with UBS 5 and Tyndall House against the majority text. With this example, we break that pattern that was established in the last two examples. Here we're in 1 Corinthians 13.3, where the EHV says, If I give away everything I own, and if I give up my body, that I may be burned, but do not have love, I gain nothing. As you can see from the chart here, um, translations based on the United Bible Society's um, text, not the 5th edition because it was published too early, but it has the same text as the new UBS 5. The New Revised Standard Version says, so that I may boast and not that I may be burned. Here the EHV agrees with the majority text and the Tyndall House Greek New Testament and disagrees with the modern critical editions represented by the Nestle Elan 28th and the UBS 5th editions. This example is like the last. Here uh, the HV has, on the contrary, we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. The um, UBS 5 text would translate as the 2011 NIV has it there, we were like young children. So rather than gentle, it reads like young children. Here the EHV agrees with the majority text and Tyndall House against UBS 5. So it's almost as if, Ten if Tyndall House sees enough ancient evidence in support of the majority text reading to adopt it, then the EHV translators seem to reason in a, in a similar way. I don't know if they were at all influenced by Tyndall House, but they seem to be thinking similarly, at least sometimes. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, it uh, reads, uh, what, what, what was done on it will be burned up on the day that the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be dissolved with great heat. The earth and what was done on it will be burned up. Um, first, I'd like to draw your attention to the footnote on this chart, footnote A under EHV, which I have uh, the phrase in the night there in red. That could mislead some readers because it says a few witnesses to the text add in the night, but both the majority text by Hodges and Farstad and the Robinson Pierpont Byzantine text include in the night. So presumably most of the manuscript evidence says in the night there. Uh, nevertheless, if the Byzantine text is considered to be a local text and not widespread, then the footnote is consistent with the notice in Appendix 1. This is the notice I have in mind where they say that a reading that does not have early or widespread support but that was present in the King James, they may reflect with a note that says a few witnesses to the text read so and so. And that's the f 
That's the format they use here, a few witnesses to the text add in the night. So it must be in their view that this majority text reading is not uh, early, or perhaps because the Byzantine text is isolated to the Eastern Roman Empire, not widespread. With regard to the major point, the translation here at the end of the verse will be burned up. The United Bible Society's 5th edition and the Nestle Elan 28th edition have will not be found, but I haven't seen any translations that follow that reading. The uh, 2011 NIV, which you see on the right, agrees with UBS 4 and Tyndall House and having laid bare. The EHV disagrees with both of them, and it follows the reading of Alexandrinus uh, 048, uh, the majority text, and several translations. So I suppose in their view that is early enough and widespread enough to retain the traditional reading of burned up. In 1 John 2.23, the um, EHV includes material that is absent from the majority text, but the one who confesses the Son has the Father as well. As you see on this chart, I've shown you the 1560 Geneva Bible, which relegates that second half of the verse to a footnote, and that's because it isn't in the Greek text that they were translating, or not in most of them. Now, the EHV does not include a footnote here, and that's interesting to me. Per Appendix 1, they say that a reading that has very little earlier widespread support in the witnesses is not cited in a footnote to avoid an overabundance of textual notes. And I think that's, they're correct that the early support for the absence of the second half of the verse is minimal, but most manuscripts do in fact omit the second half of the verse. So I suppose, uh, again, as the point I made in the last uh, selection, again here, it may be that they consider the majority text manuscripts to be local to the Eastern Roman Empire rather than widespread. In Second Thessalonians 2.8, we have the passage that reads, Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy when he appears in splendor at his coming. And it's interesting that the EHV has adopted the majority text reading consume with rather than kill with. ESV here I show on the right has uh, kill with in accordance with the United Bible Society's 5th edition, Nestle Elan 28th edition, and in this case Tyndall House as well. So here we have the EHV adopting the majority text, but um, they disagree with Tyndall House when they do it. Other earlier examples we saw EHV adopting the majority text, but they had Tyndall House on their side. Here, uh, the reading does have ancient support, so it is rather different from 1 John 2.23, where the EHV didn't even consider the majority text reading, reading worthy of a footnote, uh, and here they adopt it, because there is some ancient evidence for it. The final example in this section is taken from Jude 5, where the EHV reads, I want to remind you, though you already know all these things, that after the Lord rescued his people out of the land of Egypt, he later destroyed those who did not believe. The point of variance is, uh, well, one point of variance is the, the words, the Lord. The Tyndall House Greek New Testament and UBS 5 both have Jesus at that point. Uh, EHV is following the reading in Codex Sinaiticus and the, the majority text, which both have the Lord. And so this is an, in another instance where the EHV is following the majority text against the Tyndall House Greek New Testament. Uh, just as an aside, I want to point out that uh, the ESV uh, reads Jesus, but it did so well before the text of the Nestle Elan 28th edition adopted it. Earlier editions of the critical text in A27 and UBS 4 both read the Lord at this point, and the ESV was well ahead of them in adopting Jesus as the reading. The next section of the video is entitled Gender Accuracy, and I have three slides. The first one is based on this passage from Matthew 16, 24 through 26. As you see, the EHV does not avoid the gender ma masculine sounding pronouns. 
um, but it does translate uh, the Greek word for man as a person. In the next example, which is taken from Romans 12.1, you see that both the New Revised Standard Version and the 2011 NIV translate uh, the Greek word for brothers as brothers and sisters. The EHV uh, put, uh, provides a footnote that allows the reader to decide whether males and females are in view. And the last example I think is perhaps the most famous one, Revelation 3.20 through 22, where the uh, EHV again uses the masculine sounding pronouns, which when I was young were gender inclusive pronouns. It does omit one in verse 21, which the ESV includes. Uh, ESV has, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, whereas the EHV just says, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. In this next section, we will look at um, the EHV's promise to retain figures of speech and not uh, drain the uh, translation of uh, color and vigor. Here, uh, unfortunately, in Mark 7.22, they seem to have done that. Uh, they place an, an explanation in the text where the KJV had an evil eye. The EHV uses the word envy. The next example, I think the uh, EHV does better in Acts 2.17, where the New American Standard Bible, which I think is probably the uh, most famous for draining the translation of color and life, um, translates uh, the word flesh as mankind. The EHV retains flesh, the NASB has mankind. Similarly here in Acts 13.35, the um, EHV has the expression, the figure of speech, C decay. You will not let your Holy One see decay. Whereas the New American Standard has your, your Holy One to undergo decay. And then in a footnote it says see corruption. Galatians 3.19, um, EHV has hand of a mediator whereas the New American Standard has agency of a mediator and puts hand in a footnote. And then the last example, 1 Peter 3.20, in this ark a few, that is, eight souls were saved by water, rather than use the figure of speech souls, the New American Standard has persons. The final section of the video I've entitled Miscellaneous. These are just miscellaneous observations. I do not intend to make any uh, kind of uh, judgment on the translation at all. We will just end the video after the miscellaneous section with uh, translation credits. I'll let you make up your own minds how well you like uh, the HV based on these choices. The first um, miscellaneous observation is at 2 Samuel 21.19 where uh, we read that Elhanan, the son of Jair, the Bethlehemite, killed the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, whose spear shaft was like a weaver's beam. The footnote there uh, indicates that the EHV actually did not translate 2 Samuel 21.19 as it appears in the Hebrew. They chose to translate the parallel text in 1 Chronicles 20, verse 5. In uh, Isaiah 7.14, they have, look, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and name him Emmanuel. There is not even a footnote regarding the choice of virgin at this point. I've, I've taken us to Daniel 9, uh, 25 through 27, and I've done so just to point out how interpretive some of the footnotes are here at the bottom of the page for this section. As you can see in the chart, um, the seven sevens, they explain that they extend from Daniel to Nehemiah, and then the 62 sevens are from Nehemiah to Christ. Another footnote explains that Titus is the general who destroyed uh, Jerusalem in 70 AD. He is the one, uh, the people, he's the ruler who is coming, whose people will destroy the holy place. And then uh, the one who will confirm the covenant for the many during 1-7, the footnote identifies as the Messiah. There are other interpretive footnotes in Daniel, 
And then I noticed one well at, uh, as well at Genesis 6 1, where uh, the footnote indicates that the sons of God were the descendants of Seth. In uh, John 10 29, the HV reads, My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And I thought that was uh, interesting that there's no footnote here. You can see in this chart the New Revised Standard Version reading which is uh, in agreement with uh, UBS 5 and Tyndall House. And yet, that reading is not even mentioned in a footnote in the EHV. In Galatians 2, 15 through 16, the ESV has, We are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. We know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in like most of the modern English translations I've had the opportunity to look at, the EHV opts for the objective genitive here, so Jesus is the object of the faith. The NET, which you see on the right of the chart, prefers the subjective genitive, so Jesus is the one who is faithful. In Revelation 13.10, and in a similar passage in 14.12, the EHV gives a fairly free rendering. It reads here in 13.10, Here patient endurance and confidence are needed by the saints. Uh, contrast that with the revised version. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. The revised version is fairly literal. Uh, 14.12 uh, has the same kind of insertion of needed by. In the introduction, the HV says that when a freer translation is necessary to communicate clearly, a more literal rendering may be preserved in a footnote. Oh, I wish they would have opted to do so here. I think it would have been useful. So we'll conclude with this final observation, and then we'll roll the credits. The um, passage in question here is Matthew 28, 19 through 20 where the EHV has, therefore, go and gather disciples from all nations by baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and by teaching them to keep all the instructions I have given you. It's interesting to me that it uh, has decided that to translate explicitly that baptism and teaching are the means by which disciples are to be made Although that idea isn't really in the text, um, it's a reasonable inference, and I think it's interesting that they've chosen to do it this way. Well, thank you very much for watching. You should be seeing now the credits. And remember to like and to subscribe if you feel so inclined. Thank you.